I don't, I just don't know where to start yet. I don't know where to start. I, but I am a firm believer in that things happen for a reason and opportunities are presented in your life for a reason. And I, and just being mindful and keeping your eyes open to when something pops up that you weren't necessarily expecting, is that the thing that you're supposed to run with? Or is it supposed to lead you to the next thing that you're supposed to run with to answer those questions mm -hmm. of how do I take this and, and pay it forward in some way? This is an It All Media production. Welcome to the Fuck It All podcast, a show inspired by and dedicated to modern women undoing it all. I'm your host, Casey Let Gordon. On this show, I sit down with everyday women having what we call fuck it all moments. You know, those moments in time where we choose what's best for ourselves above anything else, often in opposition to the expectations of society, family, community, and hell, even our former selves. So settle in for the new stories that define us and the conversations women want to have. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Fuck It All podcast for modern women redefining what it means to have it all. My name is Casey Let Gordon. I'm your host. And today I am sitting down with dear friend and fellow Fuck It All moment haver, Melissa Hefner. Welcome to the show. Hi, Casey. I'm glad to be here. So Melissa and I were talking. Melissa does a lot of really cool things for her day job and is very accomplished. And I said, I mean this with no offense, but the most interesting thing about you is none of those things. And I want to have the conversation that we were having before we hit record of how are you today? Melissa was eating some granola. Her nails look great. She's like, my blow dryer dr died. I'm bitching about my husband being a million miles away over in Dubai, living life with a toddler. That's just where I'm at today. It's a rainy, nasty day. And I don't want to put on a smiley face. I just want to talk about exactly where we are. So let's do that. All right, let's dig in. You and I were talking about that you and I hadn't caught up in a little while. And so we were catching up maybe a month ago, talking about fuck it all, how it came to be. And you're like, oh yeah, I had one of those years. I think that quarantine and COVID has been this giant magnifying glass, especially on women, on parents. I have felt that. And I mean, obviously the business, but even within, you know, the business is one thing, but day to day of what am I building? And why are we building it? I'll give you a, a quick example of one of the things that was my business partner I were talking about this morning. So I did a women's CEO training last week, and there was this idea of play to win versus play not to lose. And at first it hit me. I'm like, yes, we need to be playing to win. Like, what are all the things we're doing? So like I messaged my business partner, I'm telling her this. I'm like, we got to like get serious this morning over coffee. She's like, I'm call in bullshit. What are we trying to win? That's fucking <laughs> stupid because you know what, when somebody wins, that means there's a loser and I'm not about losers because we're all on our own journey. We all got to figure out what works. So I don't want to play to win. I want to do what makes us feel in our power. And hopefully we make a lot of women win. And I'm like, you know what? I was back in an old environment, very traditional minded. And I, after all this year of growth, I just muscle memory went right back into doing things that I deliberately left. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that resonates with you. Let's use that as a jumping off point. Yeah, it absolutely resonates with me. I mean, I think, yeah. So, you know, with my job, I'm at, I'm at Georgia tech and I'm with all these really smart science-y engineering type people. And so I, I do a lot of, <laughs> I fight imposter syndrome almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I have two degrees in English, right? This, I, I feel like I have no business in a lot of ways doing what I do with these entrepreneurs at tech. And I also look around at, at so many of the people that I work with and they're doing so many incredible things and they're busting their asses. And I feel like to your point, I should be doing more, right? I should be trying to get to the head of the pack. I should, you know, be the thought leader in X, Y, and Z. And that's just not, that's just not me. I am much more relational based. I have an entire life outside of my job that I really like. Ta and what you do? <laughs> I do. I really do. Um, <laughs> and, and that's, I don't want to be that person. And I, I can slip into that mindset of I should be doing more. I should be taking the next leap. I should be making more money, right? I should be writing more articles and getting published. And I mean, all of that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but then what gets sacrificed as a result? And what do I miss out on as a result of not continuing to do the things that are really relational with my work? So yeah, I'm right there with you. I think it's really why I love these conversations because 
cut to, you know, two years ago, you and I knew each other in our day jobs. Like that was how this all came to be. But in having this conversation about honestly, where I was at on a very personal level with motherhood, with my Mm -hmm. husband, with my own asking, I would say the conversation we had a month ago was cut to this like deeper level. And as you were just saying that of like, I have a life outside of my work and that doesn't mean I don't love my work and I don't do a great job, but I'm more than that. And that is also really valuable, if not more valuable. That's the first, this is the first time in my whole life that I've started to have these conversations and realize that we're not alone, but we, it is really hard to find women in that space. I find unless you go first and say like, Hey, I'm feeling this way. And then a bunch of other people raise their hands. Like, yeah, me, me too. Yeah. No, I think in that conversation, I mean, we hadn't talked in months and then we chatted one day and I think I, I think I dropped on you like right off the bat that I had started therapy during yeah. COVID. and I'm like, well, it's Casey. I can trust her. She's got the fuck it all podcast. Like she's, she's all about authenticity. And that's really, I think, what I want to seek out more than anything is just those relationships, those conversations where where you're being real and I'm not going to apologize for it, right? I am I am a better person because of it and I have learned a lot and I'm not sure I would have survived COVID without it. Um, uh, talk, talk to me about your experience with therapy. I've been off and on in therapy for the past, call it mm-hmm. six or seven years. I actually just started mm-hmm. with a new therapist yesterday, big fan trying to yeah. find that like perfect match. Right, but right. Talk to me about how that came to be, because I think growing up, I thought you go to therapy when something's really fucked up. And sometimes yeah. in my life it has been, but there's also a beauty of just having a person and a sounding board when yep. you're just okay. Yeah. So this is my third time in therapy. I went the first time as a child and that was not a great experience. That was an awful experience and actually kept me out of therapy for, Mm. oh, probably, I don't know. I don't do math in my head very well, but I'm going to say 15 years. Well, first of all, I didn't talk to the therapist by myself. My parents were in the room and if it wasn't both of them, it was my mother. So how can you really say anything? Right. And you know, whether it, actually was what I was told or what I perceived during those conversations was that I needed to change and here are the ways I needed to change and then it would all be better and I can remember thinking I don't I don't know how to do that Um, and I don't think I had the capacity to do that right as a 10 11 12 year old and the next time I went was in crisis moment I it was um, early 2000s I was married we were not trying to start a family surprise here came a positive pregnancy test and then about a week or so later here came a miscarriage um, so this wide range of emotions of oh my god we did not want this we're not trying for this didn't even know if we were going to have a family to surprise you're having one to never mind you're not Mm. threw me into a tailspin so that that therapy experience came out of crisis and really made me deal for the first time in my life with a lot of the issues that i had struggled with privately but probably didn't even know i had and had never articulated all around being an adopted child and what that means and where you fit in in the world and and who your people are and why you are you like you are and why you think the things that you do and do the things that you do and so it was really the first time i dug into sort of you know family and family of origin and what that means and then it just you know i got past that crisis and i was fine and then enter covid and i was i realized i was just angry about Mm -hmm eight months in, and there were a number of things that had happened. You know, we now have a a daughter who's um, 15 and uh, some things had happened to her. God bless you. (laughs) Oh my gosh. When I, when we went in and found out we were having a little girl, when we went and did the ultrasound, I was positive I was having a boy. I knew I needed to have a son. My relationship with my mom had always been we were not best friends, right? It was not that type of relationship. And so I did not want to raise a little girl. And after the technician told us it was a girl, my husband was thrilled. And I don't think I talked for the next hour. And on the way home, my husband finally said, what, what is wrong with you? And I said, I cannot do this. 
So I cannot raise a girl. They are it is too hard. And there are too, so many things I'm going to be worried about with her. And a lot of them have come true. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? In terms of raising a baby girl. But it's also, you know, I can't imagine the world without her. But she she had some really tough experiences at the beginning of COVID, which when you're living with the same three people 24 seven, not even going out of the house to go to school or work, it gets really hard. And I realized I was just super angry by January of this year, I was very angry. And I thought that my marriage was falling apart. I really did. And I can remember approaching my husband about it and saying, we have got to get this figured out. We are just, I mean, we are a breath away from separation and divorce. And he was like, I, what? <laughs> I'm totally not with you. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Which really adds the fuel to the fire of like, yeah, how yeah. do you not even know me in yeah. this marriage? Right. And I said, well, you know, we have got to go to therapy. And he's like, I really, I really don't think that we do. And I was like, fine, I'll do it myself, you know, because I do everything anyway. I'll just go do this and I'll get fixed. Which was my mentality about therapy. And I started in on it and I was able to articulate just how angry I was and why I was so angry. And yeah, my, it had nothing to do with my marriage <laughs> um, and had everything to do with all other kinds of traumas that I was dealing with that hadn't really processed yet. So it has been, I'm, you know, I'm, I've graduated, I guess you could say to meeting with my therapist every other week. And every time we start a session, I think, I don't really have anything to talk about today. Like I'm fine. Right. Like Casey, you asked me this morning, how am I? I was like, I don't know. I'm good. I'm here. I'm here. Right. And every week that I meet with her, I'm just like, oh, oh, there are issues. <laughs> there are things that I'm worried about. There are things that I feel are holding me back from my relationships with people or any kind of personal growth. And I'm super excited to be with her. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. I it, it, Hearing you articulate that of being angry and not knowing where to put that blame, right, is because I think, I don't know, this is my experience, I feel like I am doing so much in my work, in my home, for my kid, for my partner. I'm trying to remain healthy, right? Like we're eating good. We're having dinner. We're seeing family. We're doing all of these things that feel like, well, that should equal a happy life. And I, I felt really angry over the past probably couple months, my husband and I, so he, his MBA program will be done in December. So we're about two months out, but two months ago we had what I'll call the come to Jesus. It was mm -hmm. over him not making coffee, which is never about coffee, but it was this time. <laughs> I was angry at how invisible mm -hmm. I felt. And I wanted to put that so much on him. You don't see me, you don't do right. And some of that was probably true. But so much of it was how I was not, I didn't, wasn't asking for what I needed. I was making myself a martyr in spaces that I didn't have to. Mm -hmm. I was making myself small because I wasn't all the things I used to be. I was making up narratives in my head around what people saw and thought, and that was making me not feel in my power. And similar to you, I, I wanted to place the blame and you know, uh, no marriage was perfect. No, relate. Like there is probably blame to go around. There are things that can be better, but so much of it was about me. And then it's taking that ownership. I often, as a, a mother of a daughter, feel this sense of responsibility to model the things I eventually want her to be and have this strength. And then I feel pissed at myself of why did you make yourself small? Why did you not mm -hmm. hold yourself accountable to these better things? You would want her to do that. And it becomes like a vicious cycle of I'm pissed. I'm pissed at myself. Mm -hmm. When you're pissed at yourself, there's no way you can arrive and level up. And so I, I found myself in that again this week. And I had a friend of mine that said, write down at the end of the night, what you feel like is choking you, whether it's time, mm -hmm. whether it's money, whether what is the thing that's making you feel, and then light that bitch on fire and let her literally burn over a candle. And if you wake up in the morning and she's still not out, burn her again. Yeah. I did it last night. It was very therapeutic. <laughs> I strongly recommend it for any listeners. I don't feel a sense of autonomy over any part of my life, right? Mm -hmm. As an entrepreneur and building something. And I think this is true when you work in traditional organizations, but I don't get a paycheck at the end of the week to say, you did a good job. You put in these hours, here's your money. So there's 
not a sense of autonomy or control. I'm dependent on my partner for our financial be- well being right now. That's as somebody who grew up with a single mom and an entrepreneur, like that idea of not having financial independence, you know, talk about bringing up things and demons from way back when. And yeah. then I have a toddler, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> like she doesn't give a fuck. What kind of control is going on there? <laughs> control. The fight that we had this morning over her wanting to wear a full winter coat in 70 degree weather and wanting to wash dishes, which means just splashing water everywhere before getting to school for breakfast. I mean, that was enough to take it out of you. And so, but I realized I was working with my therapist this week. I don't know if you feel this. I'm not indulgent with self-care. I just do the bare minimum. Hmm. So like, if you think about a battery, I'm in red and I'm like, let's just get to yellow. I don't even Hmm. know what it looks like to get to green. And I don't even know what, I mean, I, you know, I love to scroll through Instagram and read all the the funny and then, you know, motivational quotes that are there and something I read something, I don't know, last night or this morning, like why, why do we even, why do we even need self-care? Like, can we get to a point in our lives where self-care is not a, a thing that we actively have to seek out because our entire life is self-care? Mm. I don't even know what that looks like. Like I get a massage once every three weeks. That, that's self-care, right? Is that, and that feels indulgent. But then it's also like, I don't know if you feel this way and maybe your massage does that because it could serve other things. It's alone time. It's quiet time. It's time to think your body feels good. But I find that sometimes the things that I put in the self-care bucket, I'm going to go get my nails done. I'm going to go for a walk by myself. Mm -hmm. I, they feel like fixing the symptoms of just like a short term, like, oh, that was a little burst of alone time. That was a little burst of autonomy. It doesn't feel truly nourishing. And then in the back of my mind, it's these questioning of, and maybe with a 15 year old, you feel less of that because they are a bit more independent. You have some of that. I I don't know, but I feel like what is, what is waiting for me? It's like when you go on vacation for work and then you're like, that vacation was great, but God, the emails that are waiting when I get back, it almost takes away some of that indulgence. Yeah. Because then you have to almost quote unquote pay for it when you come back. And I, I don't want to be presumptuous to say that men or other, you know, fathers or other, but I do think that as women, we, we carry this, this like internal dialogue that that's all things that we're responsible for. I don't know if that resonates at all or if. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I often feel guilty as I'm driving to that massage, right? Because I'm leaving people at home. I'm leaving activities at home. I'm leaving meal meal prep or walking the dogs or checking emails. I mean, whatever it is, right? Um, Like, can I, can I go do this? Is it okay? Have I earned it? Right. Do I I deserve it? it. Oh yeah. 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 (sighs) What did your therapist say about that? Drop us some, like, what, what would they say? Oh, I don't even know if we've gotten to that yet. (laughs) Well, she would answer my question with a question. (laughs) As all good therapists do. Right? Yeah. Like how, how would you earn it? What does that mean for you? When wouldn't you deserve something? Right? (laughs) Which that, you know, when they answer your question with a question, the good ones are the ones that stop you dead in your tracks. Right. And you say, I have no answer for that because it's not substantiated in anything truth. It's all just fiction in my head. The stories we tell ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Did you find it hard as you started to go through therapy as an independent person Mm -hmm. and individual to then come back into your regular life, especially COVID. We're all, like you said, in the same four walls all the time. Do you find it hard to come back to your family unit, to your daughter, your husband with the growth that you were going through and being able to communicate that or have them receive it? Were there any Mm -hmm. tensions there? Of course. Well, first of all, so because we were all within these four walls, (laughs) I would take myself over to my in-laws house. So I had complete privacy. Uh, because they retreated to their second home during COVID. And I would probably spend the next hour after therapy just in quiet doing work stuff, right? Because I was completely drained. And I, one of the things I had to work out with her was how do I go and now interact with my family? And how do I communicate some of the things I need to tell them about how I'm perceiving a situation or how I want to approach how we do things or how I need to communicate something that's going to be really difficult for me to communicate. And I've never tried before because of that difficulty. So that's one of the things we actually had to work out, like what words will I use? 
Mm. <laughs> when will that, I like them? role playing of it and actually giving you the tools? Yes. But yeah, it's gotten better as I've gone through, but those first couple of months after the sessions, I would feel literally drained. And some of it, you know, obviously when there's tears during therapy, you are literally draining yourself in some ways, right? And it's exhausting. But even the days where I wasn't crying or having any release like that, it's just so, it's mentally exhausting in a lot of ways because you want to be able to, you are in a space where you have full license to articulate exactly what you're feeling. And so you wanna get it right. And it, it takes a lot of effort, but man, thank goodness. Thank goodness. <laughs> I've heard that from so many women, especially moms and wives that go or partners, I won't even say, you know, necessarily, but that go through some self-help and do that work that when they come back into the environments in which they've allowed these things to happen or structured it in a way that doesn't serve them, it can feel really personal mm -hmm. and almost like an attack on the other people to say, I don't want to do it this way anymore. Yeah. And that is something that, uh, I've struggled with a lot. And I think, I, I think about, I have a, one of my sisters, she was talking about that, that you go on this personal growth, but if that other person isn't in step with you of understanding your journey, that can create space and distance too, which, you know, adds a whole other level of complexity of in the narrative in your mind, is it selfish that I'm going through this growth? I don't want to hurt them. And recognizing that your growth is not personally an attack to them. No, and more than anything, your growth should probably be a boon to them, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have someone who, and I'm lucky in this regard, my husband very much supports me, supports my growth, wants to, he you know, always, after every session, we'll say, how did it go, right? And he's not looking for me to divulge my innermost secrets. If I want to, he's very open to it. If all I say is, it was good, we leave it at that, right? But has has come along with me and and, and my daughter too, and they will sometimes say to me when something's getting a little tense or when our emotions are starting to ramp up, you know, what, is this something you're going to go talk to, you know, and then says her name because <laughs> they all know her. <laughs> um, and I'm like, well, maybe, yeah, actually I probably should. <laughs> Thank you for that reminder. Yeah. I'm going to write that down. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, I, I also... Casey, get, I feel a sense of guilt because I know that I have an extreme amount of privilege in being able to, A, have the time to do this type, mm. type of work with someone, with a professional, B, have the financial means to do this type of work. And I keep thinking, maybe this is the guilty part of me, but I feel like there, I need to then give back because mm. of it. Like, what am I learning? And how am I changing? And then how will I give back? Because I get the privilege of doing this growth, of meeting with this person, of talking through all of my big feelings and uncomfortable situations I've been in and learning from them and growing for them. How do I turn around? And I don't even, I don't even know what to do, right? But what do I do with this? Other than just become a better Melissa, what else do I do with it? I think conversations like this, for one, of creating a, a level of visibility, I, I could not relate to that more. I think that only women would ask that, right? We go through, we experience something really amazing and we say, how do we then let others do this too? How do we pull along those beside us that, that maybe don't have access? There's two moments in my life that I felt really strongly to that. I've talked about it on the show, six months postpartum, very high pressure job, wanted to drive my car off the road. I thought if I did not have the fine, first of all, it's a luxury to be able to leave your job, to have the means yes, for somebody sure. to be able to carry health insurance, the mortgage, like it is a luxury, let's be clear. So my decision to leave was one of privilege. Mm -hmm. Like you said, having access to, to therapy, support, the fact that I have daycare that I can send my child to, that I have a partner that said, Hey, I can cover dinner tonight, that I have a mother that lives 30 minutes away. That could be additional. Like, and I thought to myself, if I lacked an education to know that I could go get another job, if I lacked a partner that was able to hold down the financial aspect of our home, if any one of these was not true, I don't know what the alternative would have been. Mm -hmm. And that to me was you are in a place of privilege, so you will take this step, but you will do something of purpose with it. And the second, last week, I had a partner who was away 
daycare got closed. I had a very, very cool, amazing work opportunity. And I, if I did not have a support person here, my mom being able to step in and help with my daughter, I would have had to turn down that opportunity, a professional development for the business I'm building and be with my daughter. And there was no margin in my day for me to sit back and say, wow, I'm like really frustrated at this because I was leaving at 6.30 in the morning. I was getting home at 6.30 at night. It was immediately to dinner, immediately to bath, immediately down and back to sleep because I had to do it. And so as you were saying that, it has just been a magnifier for me. What do we do for those that do not have other options or resources available? And this question of access. I think there's something very innately magical about women and especially mothers that begin to ask that question Mm -hmm. because we say um, not, oh my God, good for us. We say, God, how many other people need this? Mm -hmm. And and probably even need it more. Need it more, right? We at least have the tools and and mechanisms to get through our Maslow hierarchy of needs. We have security. We have that. Yep. And there's no way you reach enlightenment if you don't. And I think that is, that is such a giant question mark. And I think that conversations like this, but we also have to then start thinking, how do we access the systems that prevent this from being true? How do we disseminate information? How do we give a lifeline to those that need it far more than you and I, because, you know, I'm sure we've been in places where it feels unbearable to go one more day, but we, we were able to. Right. Yeah. Hmm. And so I, you know, it's some, I don't, I just don't know where to start yet. I don't know where to start. I, but I am a firm believer in that things happen for a reason and opportunities are presented in your life for a reason. And I, and just being mindful and keeping your eyes open to when something pops up that you weren't necessarily expecting, is that the thing that you're supposed to run with? Or is it supposed to lead you to the next thing that you're supposed to run with to answer those questions Mm -hmm. of how do I take this and, and pay it forward in some way? Yeah. Aline Fluker was a guest on the epi- uh, one of our episodes in season two. She has a book, Get Over, I Got It. And there's two things that she says. One, live the question. So just like you said, you're right now putting this out into the world. You are on this show. You're asking, how do I take this privilege and experience and, and amplify it or create change? And then one, asking an empowered question. A lot of times we say, um, why am I so stupid? But instead it's ha- like, if you ask that, it's only going to put you in a negative place. But as you were saying that, how do I use this and amplify it? Do good. That's an empowered position that invites inspiration and invites mm-hmm. collaboration. And so I, I think that what you exactly where you're at, like, you know, you don't need my validation, but I would say <laughs> that you're doing the right things by one, being aware, and then two, asking it and living it in an empowered position that, that invites other people to do that. I think that our conversation, I would have, I have no doubt that a year from now, you and I will collaborate in some way to take this conversation one step further, whether it's leveraging those two English degrees and my thoughts and putting that on paper or, you know, we live 10 minutes from each other, bringing something to this community. And I, I think that's where, that's where the power of going back to my initial conversation. If we were playing to win where I win, you lose this, this would never be possible. Yeah. But playing where women win, that's a different game. Yes. I love that. Absolutely. I have just a personal question. Of course, we're going to record and push live to a bunch of people that we can decide. (laughs) So you have one daughter. Yes. You can tell me if we can go here or not. I have one daughter. Yes. Prior to having children, I thought I come from a big family. I'm like, I want to have four kids. Then I had my daughter. I'm like, maybe I want to have two. And then now she's two and a half. And I'm like, maybe one is enough. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to my mom last night and she's like, well, you're in a season, just wait, you might want to have more. And she was, it was almost, and I don't think from any bad place, but convincing me, like the answer to have more will come to you. Just give it some time. Yeah. And I asked her, I said, and would it be so bad if I only had one? Yeah. What'd she say? She said, no, of course not. She started backpedaling. No, no, no. That's not what I meant. I just yeah. mean, you know, it goes by fast and soon enough she'll be five and she's at school and this moment is fleeting. And I said, I just don't know if I have it in me. I already feel like I am falling short in so many areas. I don't yeah. know if I have it in me to do this again yeah. and feel like a whole and full and happy Casey. I'm so glad that I'm a mother and I love my daughter. Like you said, you can't imagine your life. 
but I don't know if I'm meant to be mom to yeah. multiple children. I don't know if that was something that you and your, you know, your husband and your family, you guys work through, or if one was always the plan or maybe no, we're the plan, but if you're open to talk about that, that's just personally somewhere I'm at. And I would love yeah. your perspective as somebody 15 years later with, with one little girl, with one, with one little girl, who's not so little anymore. She's not so tough. little. She's, she's outgrown me now, which is not hard to do. Um, <laughs> not very tall as Casey knows. <laughs> so no, that was not always the plan. Let's back up. That was not always my plan. Mm. So I got married really young. I was 22. I had been out of college six months when we got married. Okay. Also was not the plan. However, I, my husband is uh, seven, sometimes eight years older than I am. So he was a nice solid 30. And I think that is also one of the reasons our marriage has survived. <laughs> Me being so young when we got married. And when we got married, I knew that because of personal experiences, he comes from a, a divorced home that was not healthy. <laughs> they didn't do that very well. And, um, he felt very strongly th about, I think he was scared of being a dad. Honestly, I yeah. think he was scared. He didn't really know if he would have the capacity. He had seen people in his life that were supposed to love him regardless not be able to or not be able to show it and he thought despite how warm and kind and loving he is do, does that run through me too right am i going to be incapable so he would say i don't really think i want kids and i'm like dude i'm 22 i don't want kids either <laughs> sounds good let's live a yeah, decade of just fine. the two of us <laughs> um and fast forward, um, we would maybe started to have the conversations when I um, had my miscarriage. And mm. let me tell you, that blew wide open this just innate longing I had for biological children or mm. a biological child. Having been raised, I mean, adoption was always celebrated in my family. It was never a secret. It was something I needed. I was taught to be proud of. And I, and I am, and I was, however, I don't think I've met an adopted child yet who doesn't yearn to know where they came from and who they're like, and why do I have dark hair and blue eyes and really dark skin, right? Like what, yeah. who am I? And why is one of my thumbs really fat and the other is normal sex? Like just those kinds of things. And it just blew open this desire in me to not just have any child, right? Because I easily could have gone the route of adoption. I know how beneficial adoption is. I know how many children need a home. No, I wanted to carry a baby. I wanted to carry a baby and, and birth a little mini Melissa, which I didn't get. I got a mini my husband, which yep. is fine. I feel that. <laughs> so between the miscarriage in 2004, and then when we finally got pregnant in 2005 with the child that is our daughter so many conversations around it right and and my husband needing to come to grips with and trust that he would love and and me pulling him along in some of that right and telling him listen i if i need to i can do this for both of us for a little bit and we very happily got pregnant with her pregnancy was hilarious and yucky and don't miss that part of it but her delivery and having her close to me and all those experiences that i think on some level i missed as an adopted child right the immediately putting put on your mother's chest the immediately latching onto nurse right um having that person who has carried you then be with you 24 7 the first weeks of your life I wanted that and I wanted to experience all of that. My daughter was about two years old when I started making noise again about a baby number two. And my husband just wasn't wasn't on board. And he was mm -hmm. like, we have perfection, right? We have perfection already. She's healthy. She's here. She's healthy. I have that dialogue in my head. Yeah. Yes. I figured out I can do this. Like, that's what I feel like was going on in his head. Like, I can do this. I've got this. I, st yeah. I still have a good relationship with you. I have a relationship with our daughter, right? This I can handle. And uh, so I wasn't, and I was not okay with that. So we ended up going to, to a couples therapy together mm -hmm. because I could not understand where he was and he could not understand where I was. <laughs> and it feels so personal. I think when one partner 
really wants a child and what it's like, why would you not trust yeah. this Look how You know, there, I'm sure all of his arguments, you could counter argument with exactly the same. She's yeah. so perfect. We could have two that are perfect. Right. Which is why we needed a mediator to help us understand each other. Yeah. And we came to the conclusion, I came to the conclusion that the relationship that he and I had and the family that we wanted to build for our daughter was more important than either me leaving him to go have another child with someone else. That seemed ridiculous. Or us bringing another person into the mix and potentially, what if this time it wasn't okay, right? What if this time our relationship did really struggle? It's it's a strain on a marriage and you've got to be, I think you both have to be all in. You really do. One of the things that I, I don't get to do right now because of COVID, but that defined my life in 2019 was I started taking hip hop classes. Okay. And I, I throw mean twerk and I love it. And it's Does all that a video of Melissa twerking will indeed come with this episode in some capacity. I can provide that to you. Perfect. Uh, yeah, but uh, so what we turn, what we are, almost all of us are mothers. Almost all of us are in re- long term relationships with a partner. And this is our completely let loose environment. I mean, the the music lyrics aren't edited. Yep. <laughs> they have a nice E next to them. We get to really throw it down and it's so much fun. But one of the conversations that we had, sometime when we were in rehearsal was talking about our families and talking about adding children to our families. And the, I was shocked by the number of women who talked about how difficult it was to add that second and that third child. Do they, are they glad they exist in the world? 100%, like none of them, yeah. they don't regret that. I think what's so hard is the adjustment and how the relationship, the relationship changes. Everybody's relationship in the family changes when you add a new member. And so I just had to go there with Jim and I grieved. I grieved for probably three years. I couldn't go to anybody else's baby showers. I withdrew from relationships I had where my friends were having their second and sometimes their third babies. I gravitated, well, she's also awesome, but I gravitated toward a friend of mine who knew she was having one and only had one. And we are now besties. And a lot of the reason we bonded over the fact that we were gonna be mothers to only children in a society where that doesn't happen unless you can't make it happen right it's not usually a choice (laughs) and now i can't imagine life without her but she really helped pull me through it as well and i remember her saying to me one day i called her and i was again so sad and so mad at jim and we had made this decision and you know we just weren't going to grow the family anymore and by this time i had had a second miscarriage which was an accident as well um and that had thrown me into another tailspin and she finally just said this is the, this is the kind of best friend you need right she said stop it she was like enough she's like just it is just it is time to move on melissa i love that it's like give you your space to feel the things but then also be that sounding board to say like you're good yeah you're good let's move yeah. forward yeah and we have and i will say casey that it took there the grief is real right and i went through all the stages of it because i was supposed to be a mother to three or four little mini me's yep. <laughs> but in hindsight it was the absolute best thing for our family the three of us have quite an interesting bond and i wouldn't change it shockingly it shocks me to hear myself say that now i would not change it yeah yeah, I love I love this conversation because right, it's it's the question of to have kids or not have kids, right? There's judgment there. And then yep. you have them and it's like, well, why do you not want more? Why did like you said, either me and my partner are no longer together, we only had the one, or I physically cannot. There's not and that's the only that's the only okay answer. And I've really grappled with it, especially I was pregnant with um, my sister and my best friend at the same time when we were pregnant our first times. And they both have gone on to start to consider what other children look like trying. And yeah, I am not there, but I'm also in so many different places personally, right? I have a partner who I'm a single mom a lot of the time right now over these, you know, for majority of my daughter's life, he's been working full-time in school full-time. I may feel different in a year from now when we are two very present shared parents 
Mm-hmm. But this world right now, I'm like, no living other, no, nothing that eats or poops is coming into my house. No animals, no children, <laughs> like nobody else. And then also this place of building a business. And in a lot of ways that feels like a baby, right? Yeah. It's like birthing yeah. this thing to the world. And I joke that my daughter, she's a lot. Like if I had my niece as my first kid, I'd be like, bring them on. Yes. My kid, I'm like, she goes to bed at eight and so do I, because I'm tired. Yeah. And it's, it's this thought. And, you know, I, I think my husband and I are in a similar place of if it's one, we're happy. And if we're meant to have more and kind of leaving that open to, and then I hear so many comments, my gynecologist said it and other moms, oh, well, don't wait too long. I'm like, well, what if I have a seven-year-old and a baby? I'm fine. As long as we are physically able to do that, what does it matter? But the the conversations then, well, you got to do it, get it out of the way or you're better now. And isn't that so limiting too? What if I get to the point where she's school age and I realize I do miss that. I don't want to feel any sort of way by then going on that again. And just reminds me of like, we're damned if we do, we're damned if we don't. (laughs) I think, you know, the, just the older I've gotten the, and, and I felt this way during COVID too, just with the political climate mm-hmm. and the, the pandemic trying to stay as much as I can, I have not by any stretch mastered this, but in as much of a judgment free zone, if your decision is not impacting a vast majority of people, right, in a negative way, but trying to stay in a judgment free zone about the decisions people make for their own personal lives, such as either having lots of babies or zero babies. <laughs> um, it could, you just, you never know. You never know what the conversation is behind closed doors. For some reason, it also, we feel that it is okay to ask those very personal questions of people, right? Like, are you going to have another? Or why did you only have one? And for a long time, Casey, I wasn't entirely honest. I sort of led with the fact that we'd had miscarriages and then let that drop. Right. Yeah. We don't know. If we and the, can or, right. And then let people assume that that's the reason why. Well, that played into it. But another big part of it was that I'm not sure my marriage would have survived a second. I think about that often. Do you ever mm-hmm. feel that this is something I've told lately, I've talked about a lot lately and maybe other people do. I feel like I need more than most people. I feel like I, <laughs> I need more support. I need more alone time. And I, I look at people that can bring several children or other stresses into their marriage. Mm -hmm. I need a lot. And I know that my husband came in eyes wide open. We were together five years, four years before we ever got married. Like these are things that we're, you know, aware of, but I think about that now. And I, I agree with where you're at. I was my therapist this week. She, it was a new therapist. So they do the intake, you know, like tell me on a scale of one to 10. And she's like, tell me about your social life. I'm like "Uh, a three doesn't exist. She's like, tell me about like intimacy with your relationships. I'm like, "Mm, low. She's like, tell me about your sex life. I'm like, what sex life? (laughs) So like (laughs) all of these things. And then I think, you know, the minute we get our footing in one space with a toddler to then go and really exacerbate that as we are both, we're both career driven. We both want to have travel. We both want to like each other and have a connect. It, It feels like something has to give. And I don't know that that it's something that's so top of mind. I don't know that our marriage is the thing I'm comfortable letting get, right? Yeah. Yes. That's that I mean that that's what it was going to be. Yeah. Um and I and I thought how could I look my daughter in the eyes 5 years 10 down, years down the road and when she asks me why are you and dad not together say well, because we couldn't agree on whether or not to give you a sibling. Like that that conversation made no sense to me. And, you know, all of this, she has not grown up lonely. She has not grown up feeling deprived. Yes. Um, you know, she, that was the argument a lot of people gave me when, that we needed to give, like, what happens when her dad and I die? Will she be all alone in the world? Well, no, that's, that's why you build a community and why you have family and friends, um, extended family and friends. And so I just could not think of an argument where I could confidently look at her and feel very, very okay with saying to her why I had, why we had broken up our family. Um, and I will say, Casey, I, you know, she's, she's, she is a ball of fire. She is a- You have one that requires a lot too? I have one who requires a lot and I adore that about her and I would not want her any other way. And she requires a lot. Yeah, that's why I say like, and I, I and love I the shit you. out of her, but 
Yeah. Jesus, she's exhausting. Yeah. And if we had had a sibling who was less requiring of energy, that poor little child would have gotten pushed to the side a lot. Or if God forbid we had had one with just, I mean, I don't know where I would be now. I would probably not be sitting here talking to you because mm -mm. so Mm -hmm. um, I have the bandwidth to give that child everything that she needs. We have the bandwidth to give that child everything that she needs in terms of stability, attention, resources, just ourselves, right? Um, we have we have the capacity, and I think it would have been a disservice to her. And I didn't know that then, right? I, she was just a toddler, but I see that now. Yeah, I think there's a trust level that I've I've come to. I, you know, whether you call it religion or spirituality or universe, God, whatever, that I've just come to have to really trust in, in the sense that what is meant for me, if we are meant to have others, it will find me and Mm -hmm. being open to it, but also listening to that voice inside that says, maybe that's not for you. And that's okay. Even though the world might say otherwise, and I'm so grateful. Thank you for letting me ask that and us going in that, because I think that, I think there's just really limited narratives out there around what that looks like. And something I've heard you say, I don't know if that you know this about yourself, but I've heard you say it a couple of times is that there's something really magical about giving yourself and the others around you, giving this yourself the space to grieve or feel whatever you feel Mm -hmm. and still come out on the other side. So often we hear, I was upset, end of story. And Mm -hmm. you talked about it with COVID and going to your partner and saying like, Hey, I don't know if this is working and you grieved and you were pissed and you felt all the things, but you're still standing here and you all are still together. There's an endurance and a resilience and a a perseverance in that you said it when, you know, you had the miscarriage and, you know, felt the highs and lows of that when you decided not to have the second child and you grieved and it didn't sound like that was a week of grieving. It sounded like that was a, a period of time. That was years, Casey. That was yeah. Years. yeah. And I think there's something that's where we talk about fuck it all moments, turning into a fuck it all mindset. Mm-hmm. Fuck it all moments show us that we, you will get on the other side of it. It won't be without pain and, you know, hurt and growth, but you do that enough. You then sit in an okay place to say like, I don't feel good right now, but I will feel good again. Yes. And yeah. that mindset, that muscle, it's really hard. I'm lear- I'm, I'm learning now. It is the far braver and harder path to walk in a world that says, just get to the quick fix yes. or if it doesn't work, don't do it. Yeah. And instead saying like, no, I'm just, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to feel all the negative piece, but it's in service of what I'm meant to be doing next. Yeah. And I think that you have to be patient too, because I'll tell you, it didn't, you know, uh, so our daughter was born in 06 and I did not understand until 2013. I think one of the major reasons that she was still an only child and that's my, my little sister husband was diagnosed with uh, brain cancer, glioblastoma. Mm -hmm. She was 20 weeks pregnant the day they found out. And um, he lived just shy of three years past that diagnosis, which meant that she went through her the rest of her pregnancy had an infant and had a toddler while her husband was undergoing chemo radiation, you know, multiple brain surgeries. I had a seven year old at that point, right? So that baby had, there was lots of space in my life in literally in my house, in my heart to do what I needed to do for my sister with her son. Mm-hmm. Had I been a mom to another younger kid or two more younger kids, I could not have helped her in the way I needed to. And so it took me, I mean, that's just one of the, one of the realizations I've had about why my immediate family is small. I see, I understand what it's allowed me to do for the other people in my life or the other relationships that I have. I, you know, I, I don't regret it now because I know what it's, what it's afforded me, a relationship with my nephew that I maybe wouldn't have had otherwise. Right. And a relationship with my sister because of it, um, that was deepened. So, you know, it's, yes, we can sit there in the grief and we can move past it but and and sometimes it takes forever <laughs> to understand why things turn out the way they did. Oof, that 
I feel that so immensely. And I go back to where you said your daughter, she might be an only child, but she's not lonely. I guarantee the relationship that she has with your nephew long after you, your partner, your sister, and any of that generation is gone. Like that will persevere. That will be the sure. extended family. Yes. That will be. And I think there's something so magical about that. And I think about also your experiences being an adopted child and how you understand the power of, you know, made family versus given family and all of those lessons. And the more I lean into life as a story, we only understand at the end and you begin to see that's where adoption played in and that's where not having that and that's yes. where therapy and that's where this struggle it's so beautiful. I, I struggle a lot with patience. You mentioned that. I just want to get to the end and know it. But my business partner has a saying, don't rush, but you want to last forever. And I try mm-hmm. to s- mantra that daily of you. There's no need to rush because there will be plenty of time for that when it gets here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, this was good. This was good for my soul today. <laughs> I have a couple of questions that I love to ask my guest. How yeah. do you define having it all today? <laughs> Can anybody answer that? Do I people hear all answer? sorts of things? How do I? So what I have right now that feels like it all mm-hmm. is I have people in my life that I love deeply, deeply, deeply. And I know that in, if I hung up with you right now, and called any one of them and said, I need you. They would be here and vice versa, I would go to them. That to me is what it is all about. It is it is your people, it is your relationships, it is your vulnerability with them. It is not having to explain yourself, but just saying, here's what I need, can you help, right? And they the answer is always yes. Yes to that, yes to that. I mean, what I heard is, being comfortable in yourself, right? There's a a comfort that comes with settling into who you are and then knowing that where you've put your effort and your love is in the people that will hold you up when you're ready to fall. Like Mm -hmm. that's, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. What for you, what's the best part of being a woman? Oh, wow. You didn't give us these in advance to prep. (laughs) I know everybody always says they're rapid fire, but they're never rapid. Yeah, exactly. The best part about being a woman, I would say, and I felt it really acutely during the pandemic is feeling like I am part of a sisterhood. Mm. And some of that comes from my, my hip hop class that I mentioned. I mean, we have, we are doing something so scary together, right? We are moving our... (laughs) moving our bodies and expressing ourselves and being very vulnerable with each other and a place where we just hoop and holler and cheer each other on. That to me is what I think is so wonderful is that it is, it is expected that we go deep with each other. And I don't know that the men in our lives are asked to do that, right? Or even celebrated when they do that. And so that to me is what's wonderful is the fact that it, you know, stereotype or not, I'll take it because I, I, I wouldn't change the way I get to have relationships with the women in my life. Mm. It's powerful. What do you do when your power is shaken? Ooh. So, oh, that's interesting. The last time that happened or that, okay. The first thing that comes to mind is that I had an experience that was just really awkward with me and someone, a, a man that I know that just felt very, it felt uncomfortable. I don't think it was a me too moment, but it was maybe the closest I've gotten to a me too moment. And I, I called a a girlfriend who was also a coworker. And I was like, I just had this moment, fuck this all. Let's go buy some shoes. And that sounds so cliche, but we both had an event to go to that night. And I wanted to kick ass. I wanted to walk in with footwear that everybody went. Yeah. And so we did. (laughs) <laughs> there's, and, there's okay. something about refining your power though, right? If like standing in a great pair of shoes did that, fuck yeah. Yeah. And a, the blisters were ginormous <laughs> and ridiculous at the end of the day. But yeah, I just, maybe it was taking back the, if I was going to be exploited for my gender, then I was going to own it. 
right? And I was going to own it with a new pair of ridiculous shoes. <laughs> I love that. And that is something that I I mentioned. I was in this training last week and it was mentioned several times, like, you know, uh, don't comment on a woman's outfit or shoes. And yes, I understand that is not the only thing they are, but I can't tell you how strong I feel when I feel good. And that can be sometimes in a pair of yoga pants and a ball cap. And it can be sometimes in a pair of amazing heels and a dress and my makeup. It's It's Mm -hmm. what is helping me find that power. So I arrive in whatever situation and I'm so done with stereotypes or not, because it's, isn't that just another form of judgment, right? Don't do that. Anytime you're telling somebody not to do something, Mm -hmm. it's, you're putting a boundary on them that may not be yours to give. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. to great shoes. (laughs) Um, what are you reading right now? Ooh, yeah. So I just finished. Oh, and I'm not going to be able to remember the author's name. It's all right. We'll put it in the show notes. Okay, cool. So I just finished a book called Say Nothing. It's written by, he's an Irish author and it's um, an account of the- um, Patrick history. Raiden Keefe, I believe is it. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, and it's all about the the IRA and the conflict with Northern Ireland. And it's something I- I don't think I knew how modern day some of those issues were um, Mm. and still plague uh, Northern Ireland to this day. So that was a whole sort of history lesson for me of trying to understand the troubles and the conflict that go back that started way earlier than I thought they did. I think they date to the 1920s, if not earlier. I'm sure there were strifes before then, but particularly the origin of the IRA. Nobody quote me on this. Just go read the book. But this all the way a historian guys, she's Thank just you. the lady that read the book. That's right. All the way through modern day and how it's still active. And then I was up in the North Georgia mountains this weekend with some girlfriends. I went on my first camping trip in 25 years, slept in a tent, did not get attacked by bears. Camping is not tale. for me, but I'm so glad you had that experience. You know what, Casey, it is really not for me either, but maybe once a year. Um, yeah, like I like the, like the allure of it for like maybe a night. Yes. And so, you know, we went into this cute little store up in Clayton, Georgia. And of course, I, for whatever reason, this camping store has an amazing book section. And because I'm a reading nerd, I gravitated toward that. And I walked away with a book that's fiction, but it's about the IRA. And it's about two sisters, one of whom is not in the IRA, and one of whom, surprise, is and what that means for them. And it's called Northern Spy by Flynn Berry. Okay. And it's just putting into perspective to me what what those families living, particularly in Belfast, the trauma that they're still living with. Um, And I've been to Ireland a lot. (laughs) I really like it. I was going to say, you're you're making me want to do some history lessons and a little traveling. Yes, and the and this the the main character is a is a mom, and she's got a six month old son. And how is someone who lives in a very wealthy country has a really nice job, lives in a place where many of us love to go on vacation, right, right. or go back and find our roots, <laughs> right? Um, because the number of us who have ancestors who immigrated from Ireland, how can she get on the bus every day and be scared? that perhaps she won't make it home to see her Mm. son or why is she looking it's like if you and i had to walk outside and look for a car bomb underneath our car before we turn over the ignition has that ever occurred to you talking about maslow's hierarchy of needs yeah the level of safety and security that never exists yeah so you know i get stuck in my little bubble of safety you know here especially where i live in atlanta seems like a very safe place and i forget that there are women that I probably have a lot in common with that led a, leave a very different life. So right now that's what I'm fascinated with. Love that. What's the best advice you've ever been given? Um, oh, Lordy. It can just be good advice. Let that shit go. Mm, yes. Uh, don't argue with crazy. Don't argue with crazy. <laughs> don't argue with crazy. There are so yeah. many people that just came to my mind there. Yep. Um, all right. We like to leave our listeners with this. If you can tell younger Melissa one thing, what would you tell her? Oh, um, 
you are going to have so many people that love you for you. Mm. Hell yeah. And, and, and really want you to be a part of their lives and would be devastated if you weren't. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and it's going to be okay. It's yeah. going to be okay. It's all going to be okay. Yeah. Melissa, thank you for taking time with me this morning. This was so, so wonderful. Good for my soul. And always feel like these conversations come to me when I need them. Thanks, Casey. I'm glad to be here. I was super nervous, but it's so fun to talk to you always. I forgot oh. we were being recorded. <laughs> good, good, good. I love to hear that. Yeah. For everyone listening, thank you for coming along this morning. This is Casey Let Gordon. I'm the host of the Fuck It All podcast. Today, my guest, Melissa Hefner, and I talked about, Lord, everything. We talked about playing to win and how that's bullshit. We talked about therapy, having just one child, relationships, family of origin, the IRA, <laughs> literally everything. Yeah. This was great. We'll see you next time. And that's a wrap on another episode of the Fuck It All podcast. This is an It All Media production, a home for the news stories that define us and the conversations women want to have. If you haven't already, go over to itallmedia.co slash join to get it all in your inbox every week. And make sure you subscribe here and drop us a rating because baby, that's how this whole world goes round. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time on the Fuck It All podcast.